Welcome. This is Brian Buchanan and Jean Deschamps from the University of Alberta Department of Critical Care Medicine. This tutorial will cover thoracic evaluation for pleural effusions and procedural guidance. The last leg of our lung ultrasound journey is on the famous pleural effusion. I'll tell you, chest x-rays are notoriously difficult to use to diagnose an effusion. And as you begin to practice this skill, you will see more and more the conflict that arises between chest x-rays and the sonographic equivalents, as described here. This is an actual patient where there was a direct conflict between the chest x-ray report and the ultrasound findings. The learning outcomes in this tutorial are first to apply thoracic ultrasound to differentiate pleural effusions from consolidation and to really help you maximize safety in performing this procedure. Finally, to aid in the detection of complications related to thoracentesis or pigtail insertion. What we want to really focus on here is the presence of pleural effusion and some procedural basics. Here are some key reference articles that will help you understand some of the core topics and some of the procedural uh, sequencing. Basic physics are very important when you deal with ultrasound. Uh, you have to understand that sound waves are propagated without uh, any tenation fluid as compared to air. Air blocks everything, fluid transmitted perfectly. The presence of fluid uh, does appear as a very anechoic space in most ultrasounds. This is a good example of uh, what can be seen on ultrasound. On the left side, we have a completely anechoic structures that transmit ultrasound waves perfectly, uh, leading to a black space. Uh, the second one from the left is an ipoechoic structure in which there is some denser material within the fluid that leads to some artifact formation from the ultrasound waves. The third one is an isoechoic structure in which essentially all the tissue has more or less the same echogenicity. And on the right side, on the fourth image, you have structures that block ultrasound waves uh, quite well and reflect them uh, much better than surrounding structures, such as in these lesions. One ultrasound performs exceptionally well uh, compared to, ch to chest x-rays. In most cases, its sensitivity and specificity is around 100%. The, the reason to drain effusion, of course, really depends on the patient's condition, clinical status, and things like the size of the effusion. You can use really any probe to assess uh, a fluid-filled space. However, in the thorax, because of the depth, really you should be using a convex probe or a phased array probe. In most cases, for simplicity, I would encourage you to use a phased array probe on the abdominal settings. In this case, in standard orientation, the probe marker is directed cephalad or towards the head. A big advantage of the phase of a probe in the chest is that its footprint is quite small and can be lodged in between two ribs. The convex probe, or curvilinear probe, uh, has the advantage of covering more surface, but uh, can sometimes be more difficult to lodge in between ribs. So how do we perform pleural space ultrasound? Whereas, whereas before, with our, with our eight-point exam, or four for each thorax, the probe should be placed in the mid-axillary line. And really you want the diaphragm in the middle of the screen. This is in the coronal plane, dividing the body from anterior to posterior. The probe can also be changed 90 degrees. And in the same position, you can reveal the axial plane or transverse plane, which is much more akin to what you'd see in a CT of the thorax. It's critical, as always, to make sure that you're looking at the right structures on the screen. And that is uh, done by having the proper orientation and uh, corresponds between your probe marker and your ultrasound marker on the screen. As such, you should have your, the marker towards the head of the patient, and this in the right setting would lead to the head of the patient being on the left side of your screen. Finally, it is important to have the right amount of depth to be able to see all the structures. In the case of a polar fusion evaluation, you gotta make sure that you have at least 14 to 20 centimeters of depth to allow penetration deep enough to identify a small but present pleural effusion. This is another good example of a chest x-ray in which there is diagnostic dilemma. The classic read of such an x-ray would be pneumonia versus right pleural effusion. The ultrasound is quite clear. There is no pleural effusion as evidenced by the absence of any uh, echolucent space above the diaphragm. There is presence, however, of a s large consolidation that occupies most of the lung. It's important to recognize to be aware of your bias. Chest x-rays and other Im imaging modalities may give you a bias interpretation, and you have to really check this at the door when you apply ultrasound to start making your own judgments, because they may actually be in direct contradiction to what's been told to you already.
do remember that the more you'll be doing ultrasound, the more you actually will be able to look at your chest x-ray with a lot of uh, detail uh, because you're able to see the exact correlation between the chest x-ray and the ultrasound that is not always seen by the radiologist who's reading the x-ray. Anatomic boundaries and pleural fusion assessment are critical. You really want to find the diaphragm, the subdiaphragmatic organs like liver or spleen, the chest wall, and lung. This helps to clearly differentiate the pleural space. You may even have to look for the subdiaphragmatic organs, including the kidneys, to help orient you. Dynamic changes such as the lung moving, which may be called lung flapping or the jellyfish sign as the tail of the lung whips back and forth in this anechoic space, may help identify the pleural space. However, atrophied spleens and fat from the, from the mesenteric organs may have a similar appearance. Again, be 100% be clear which space you're looking at. The patient with uh, cirrhosis is particularly prone to all of these features because of the presence of ascites that can lead to significant diagnostic confusion. In this case, we can see, this is from a coronal perspective, we can see the diaphragm, the pleural space, this is a potential space, obviously, and the spine in the far field with the subdiaphragmatic organs. In a normal right costal image, we will see the diaphragm and essentially this curtain sign coming over the diaphragm. You'll notice here that this is mostly lung above the diaphragm. There is a dark space in the far field, but this is largely related to dropout. There's also that mirror image artifact we talked about before. It is very unlikely there's an effusion there, as an effusion would separate the tissue planes. The left side is quite similar. The spleen is a little, a little bit more posteriorly directed, and so you may have to place the probe more towards the mid to posterior axillary line to elicit the same findings with the diaphragm easily seen. You have to be quite aware that there are significant mimics that can look like fluid depending on the anatomy of the patient. These mimics can be consolidation, subdiaphragmatic fluid, and other structures. As an example, in this case, on the left, you have a clear pleural fusion. You can see a very bright diaphragm against uh, what is likely the liver. And right above it, you have a very consolidated lung that demarcates this infusion quite well. On the right side, you have no such thing. You have a consolidated lung, you have a liver. Normally, the diaphragm is quite bright and provides a very clear separation between two structures. But as you can see in this clip, that's not the case, and that can make the differenti differentiation between the liver and a consolation quite difficult. Here we can see that there is the diaphragm moving, which is actually delineated by this structure. Below that, this appearance may be easily mistaken for the lung. In fact, this is an atrophied spleen that's really kind of marinating in an anechoic space of intra-abdominal free fluid. On the screen left here, we see actually lung sliding, which you may not have recognized at first. But the actual pleural space is above this line. And there is much more fluid below the diaphragm than there is above the diaphragm. This really emphasizes why you should be clear on your landmarks and why you should approach ultrasound systematically. If there's previous data like a CT or ultrasound showing ascites, then really I want you to be aware of such confounders. In this case, we see a large anechoic space. You should notice this anechoic space is beating. Yes, that's because this is the heart. This is a very large heart. This lady had cardiomegaly with a heart that encompassed the size of almost her entire left thorax. This is one important false positive you really don't want to miss. Above the effusion, you'll often see gradations of collapse. Large effusions may lead to a severe amount of collapse, whereas smaller effusions should lead to less collapse. As you go from the effusion up towards the apex, you will usually see the progression from collapse to less collapse to some frequent B lines to less B lines to eventual A lines as this represents the transition from collapsed lung to less collapsed lung. There are four major patterns of fusion based on their echogenicity. An anechogenic pattern, a complex non-septated pattern, a complex septated pattern, and an echogenic pattern. For the most part, these are quite descriptive in what they represent on ultrasound. On the left, you would have what would be considered an echogenic uh, structure and likely represents an hemorrhagic pleural effusion. On the right side, you would have what would correspond to probably a complex septated or non-septated pattern, depending on whether or not you believe there is layering on the bottom right. These patterns can, to some extent, help guide you into what the etiology is. In general, an 
anechogenic pattern will either be transitive, most likely transitive, and can be exudative as well in some situations. In comparison, a complex septated or echogenic pattern usually represents an exudative pattern or a hemorrhagic pattern. This, of course, has to be interpreted in the patient's clinical context. If we saw an image right in a patient with a fever, you'd probably really want a sample of that to make sure you have ruled out an infected collection. This may require a CT looking for pleural enhancement. You can also estimate the size of a pleural effusion. First of all, recognize the position of your patient. If they're sitting semi-recumbent or upright, you can measure from the base of the lung to the diaphragm. Each centimeter corresponds roughly to about 200 mils, so a 5-centimeter effusion would translate into 1 liter of fluid. This gives you a, a gross estimate of how big the effusion truly is and may, you, may allow you to better make clinical decisions about diagnosis and drainage of such effusions. This is an image in the coronal plane with the promarker towards the head. We can see clearly as before the diaphragm, the chest wall, the spine, and base of the lung. Now, depending on their position, if they are supine, um, as the lung will float on top of the fluid, you can also turn the probe 90 degrees. This, is a, this, is, this view is a bit more challenging to wrap your head around. This is more like a hemithorax CT. We can see the chest wall as it circles around. And in fact, we can see the descending thoracic aorta that's medial. We can use the same approach to measure from the lung to the chest wall and essentially each centimeter will still translate into about 200 mils. As we can see here, this is about three centimeters. This would correspond to about 600 mils. This diagram here gives you an example of that transverse scanning technique in a patient with moderate to large effusions bilaterally. Again, this is a difficult scanning technique, but I would, I would love for you to practice this if you have the opportunity on a patient with significant effusions. This is a great clip to illustrate uh, the integration of everything we've talked about. This clip was taken on the left, and you can see the spleen with what seems to be a lesion or tumor on it. This is a prime example of a left hemithorax, which shows a variety of collections of free fluid. Importantly, there's quite a bit of fluid below the diaphragm, less fluid above the diaphragm. There is a large volume of collapse. In this case, I'm much less likely to call this collapse secondary to effusion. It may in fact be secondary to rising of the hemidiaphragm. So let's say you've decided to drain the thorax based on size or based on indication. Here's some extra tips to help you understand and try to mitigate risk. First of all, you should locate the intercostal artery. Now I advise all my residents to make sure that they in fact aim for the rib and then go over to avoid hitting the neurovascular bundle. The evidence for this technique is not strong, but it does make intuitive sense. On occasional patients, intercostal vessels can be quite tortuous, especially in the elderly. If you stay in the mid-axillary line or posterior axillary line, most of these intercostals should not be crossing the intercostal space, but it can be very helpful to use a linear probe to, in fact, check for this. Intercostal artery laceration can be quite nasty. It's an infrequent event, but can lead to the requirement for operative intervention. There's also the risk of subdiaphragmatic insertion, laceration of adjacent structures such as the lung, liver, or spleen. Fortunately, this last part of laceration is much more common with a non-Seldinger technique. In this case, we can actually see the color box is placed over the inferior portion of the rib. This rib is in short axis as we see the end on the rib. Below that rib is the neurovascular bundle. We can see here the vessel as it pulsates. Another use of these ultrasound-based techniques is to be able to locate a safe place where to proceed with the procedure and also to uh, identify and measure um, the appropriate depth at which you will insert your needle. In this clip, you can um, measure the minimal depth of penetration you will have to, to, to go through with your needle. That represents the soft tissues uh, until you reach the pleura. The measure on the right represents the maximal depth that you will insert the needle at, at which point you are likely to hit the lung that is floating up to the pleura. Finally, I would recommend that you perform ultrasound as a pleural drainage in this static format. Now, in dynamic guidance, this is what you'd see in vascular access. This is more challenging in the thorax, and I'd really encourage you to focus on hitting that rib and going over to mitigate risk. So in this case, 
place the patient in the position you'll be doing the scan in, and then really find that optimal site as we highlighted earlier on. And once you've marked the access site, then enter with the small needle for freezing and the bigger needle for selding your technique. The reason why it can be quite difficult to do proper dynamic guidance is that in lower frequency probes, such, such as the curvilinear probe, um, it can be quite difficult to track the needle tip properly. Finally, as you learned from prior, you can actually use the ultrasound to rule out periprocedural complications such as pneumothorax, especially if you've not placed a chest tube. In this case, we can see again that lack of lung sliding. So I would really advise you to do a pre and post evaluation of the pleura to make sure the sliding is intact and frankly, it's left intact. Again, the position of the thorax matters. So if you're sitting up, scan more of the apex, whereas if you're supine, you'd be scanning more of the anterior portion of the chest. I'd like to thank you for listening and we'll see you again. Bye for now. Bye for now.